Welcome to Metrics That Matter. We will learn how to make sense of your fundraising data to make better decisions and raise more money with less effort. Brought to you by fundraisingreportcard.com, a simple and free analytics and reporting tool for nonprofit pros. Now measuring is easier than ever with fundraisingreportcard.com. Welcome to Metrics That Matter. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. Coming up in this episode, Zach and I discuss just how important donor retention is and how to make smarter decisions to improve retention and donation revenue. You can follow along at home by downloading the Metrics That Matter ebook at fundraisingreportcard.com slash book. With that, let's get to today's episode. Hey, how's it going? Um, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing, Tim? Uh, I'm good. I'm retaining a lot of water from... That's I weird. don't know. That's really... You uh, should, <laughs> that was a bad one. <laughs> we will start that. Wow. Uh, so okay, so okay. we talk about donor retention and you talk about how much salt you've consumed recently. Yeah. That has led to you retaining water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite salty food? Go. Salty food. Yeah. Hmm. You know, it's like sweet and salty. Uh, chocolate. Chocolate. Uh, chocolate, like the, salty the sea salt chocolate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that, that stuff's, stuff's good. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some Ghirardellis. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can we end the show now and go get chocolate? <laughs> let's, <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah, get some chocolate. <laughs> sounds wonderful. All right, maybe we'll make this a theme. We'll start episodes with food-related questions, okay, but then maybe so, our so listener retention rate will go down because they'll be leaving to. Well, maybe go. they'll be higher because they're keeping the podcast on as they go to the store to get their food. You think this is going to make the final cut? I think it'll make the final cut. <laughs> I think it should. <laughs> what are we talking about today, Tim? Donor retention. Donor retention. Yeah, chapter five of the book. If you're following along at home, with the yes, book. but you can listen along as <laughs> it's a podcast. So, <laughs> so why is this important? Why is re- I mean, it seems like a dumb question, but why is retention an important thing to keep track of? Yeah, so we've been talking about you know quite a few metrics as we've been moving through these different episodes, and obviously, if you read the book as well, retention is kind of the king of the hill when it comes to metrics and it comes to kind of baseline metrics that you want to be measuring and you want to be going in the right direction, donor retention is a big one to focus in on. Retention is going to be this measure of really how well you're building relationships with your constituents because it's measuring if they're coming back year over year, over year, over year, over year, Mm -hmm. you know, and if, and if you are building those meaningful and important relationships with that constituency, you'd think they'll renew their contributions year over year and retention rate, donor retention rate in particular gives you this measure of how well are we actually doing that? And that's huge. You know, that gives you some insight and the ability to kind of track and measure our strategies and our tactics to build those relationships working. Okay. And how does this impact your overall revenue? I mean, is this a direct correlation to great retention, great revenue? or A lot of organizations that I've had a chance to analyze their data, one of the big themes you'll see is most all of total revenues come from retained donors. There's also another theme that we won't dive too deeply into here, but average donation amounts from retained donors tend to be higher than average donation amounts from newly acquired donors. So retained donors can and usually do. Every organization is different. That's why it's really important to analyze your own data and not get too caught up in industry benchmarks and things like that. But Retained donors and their retained donations can and most likely will make up a large, you know, that 80-20 rule. (laughs) They'll Mm -hmm. make up that 80% of revenues that come into your organization. And as retention rates go higher and higher, you're lapsing. So your donor attrition is decreasing. You're going to be in a position where even if you're not pursuing too much donor acquisition, you're still having a sustainable and profitable fundraising department because those donors that already are in the organization that are, you know, have that relationship, they're not going anywhere. They're still making those contributions. It is important to note that donor retention rate is measuring how well you're building relationships with those donors. So they, you know, it's it's a total number of donors from last year divided by the uh, number of retained donors this year times 100 to give you the rate. Mm -hmm. But there's also the concept of donation retention rate. So that's the dollars that are are actually being renewed year over year. So if you think about it for a moment, you could have really high donor retention rate. Let's say you have a 100% donor retention rate. 100 of your donors from last year, all 100 of them came back this year. But your donation retention rate could be 50%. All 100 of your donors came back, but they all gave 50% smaller contributions this year. Yeah. So your donation retention rate's now 50%. To have an impact on the bottom line, and what I just described as a total anomaly, mm-hmm. yeah. 100% retention rate is 
really hard. Um, right, and yeah. 50% donation <laughs> retention rate is really hard. Most organizations that I get a chance to look at their data, their donation retention rate is actually higher than donor mm-hmm. retention rate. Donors tend to upgrade their giving. Is that because in the first couple of years, they may be testing out your organization almost? That could be part of it. I try and take a step back from necessarily like why all this is happening. And I generally leave that to the nonprofit yeah. staff or the consultant. But I think that could be part of it. Mm-hmm. You know? But you definitely see, you, I look at so many organizations' data. You know, Donor retention rate will be 42%. And then donation retention rate will be 61%. And then you know, they're like, well, why is that one so much higher? It's like, because the donors that are sticking around are, are giving more year over year. It's a beautiful thing. So to answer your question, maybe this is my style, long-winded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, to answer yeah. your question, yeah, retention can and should have a major impact on the bottom line and retention can and should make up a significant portion of total revenues that the organization receives each year. Okay. Now, what mistakes do you think nonprofits make in analyzing their retention data, if any? What kind of pitfalls should they avoid? So the first one is not measuring it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to say it's a mistake, but it, it can be a circumstance of, you know, the myriad responsibilities that are being juggled, but not measuring donor retention rate or donation retention rate. But let's focus on donor. Not measuring that is no bueno, not, not a good situation. So then a lot of folks that I've had a chance to work with over the years, what they do is they start measuring donor retention rate. Great. Mm-hmm. That in itself can start to be a little bit of a uh, pitfall, you know, where you look at overall donor retention rate and you stop there. Where things start to get more interesting is when you have segmented donor retention rate. This is a theme I've been sensing here. Segmenting is pretty powerful. It it just starts to provide some clarity because Mm -hmm. especially with fundraising, like when you think about philanthropy in general, not that any type of philanthropy is transactional, far from it. It's very emotional, but smaller contributions, not to generalize, but you know, they're going to be a little bit more transactional Mm -hmm. and larger contributions are going to take a little bit longer to cultivate and generate and realize. So when you start measuring metrics that try to quantify how well you're building relationships with these types of constituents, it's important to break that down by dollar amount. You know, smaller dollar donors will not retain as high as some of your major donors. And that's a good thing. But we should be able to measure that variance. You know, like if we retain 90% of our major donors, but then the next year it's 80 and then the next year it's 70, that's not good. You know, but at least we're aware of it so that then, you know, we start to change strategy or we, we try and identify why, answer the why question, mm-hmm. which obviously I, you know, it's every organization is different. I can't answer that, but you have to have that discussion internally. Breaking down retention rates by giving level. So under 100, 100 to 1,000, 1,000 to 5,000, whatever, you know, whatever segments mm-hmm. uh, you think make sense at your organization can start to provide some clarity. And you generally will see that smaller dollar donors are retained at a lesser amount than uh, larger dollar donors. Great. But let's measure that variance and then let's think about strategies and tactics that can influence either boosting that small dollar retention or boosting the, the, the large donor retention and things like that. Okay. And generally speaking, you'd have a lot more smaller dollar donors. So you just imagine for a lot of organizations just churning through a lot of people that retention rate is so low. It's, it also takes more people to make that number go down. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a common theme I see across the hundreds, if not thousands of data sets I've been able to look at, mm-hmm. uh, is most organizations have a base of support at the small dollar amount yeah. that generally retains at somewhere between 20 and 30% mm-hmm. and accounts for anywhere from, you know, 3 to 5% of total revenues each year, but then it accounts for like 20 or 30% of total donors or even more in some yeah. circumstances. And then it's the large dollar donors. So when I say large dollar, and I'm thinking back to, it's at fundraisingreportcard.com slash benchmarks. We have a whole giving level section, which breaks down retention rate. The last time I looked at it, it's something like 69.58% of donation revenues come from $5,000 and above donors who are retained. And this is kind of scary, but they're only retained at like 45%, 48%, something like that on average across the $26 billion we've analyzed for the benchmarks. And that represents like half a percent of total donors. The resources that you can allocate to build those meaningful relationships, because again, all we're talking about is quantifying how well we're building meaningful Mm -hmm. relationships. The resources and the time and the staff that you allocate towards those two distinctly different groups is vastly different. You know, you can't justify a gift officer for annual fund donors. You really, you just can't Mm -hmm. because they're making small contributions and they represent such a small portion of total revenues. But that's coming at this from the total, you know, like quant side of things. Yeah philosophical approach might be well you got to treat everyone well and you know you figure out ways to do that and there's a middle ground there but ultimately 
if, as long as you're measuring these metrics, you can start to see what the trends have been historically. So has something been increasing retention rate? Great, let's keep doing it. Has retention rate been falling? Great, let's talk about it and figure out what we can do to change it. Regardless of where you are on this kind of like art versus science, you know, paradigm, mm-hmm. just know that you should be measuring this to at least inform potential next step. It seems that 12 month cycle may not be the best cycle for many organizations. What about an 18th month cycle? What factors should a nonprofit look into when deciding what standard to choose for their organization? I don't know if it's not the best or not the worst. Like it, it comes down to an you know per organization basis. I think there's value in looking at both retention and attrition. So lapsed donors on a 12 month cycle and on an 18 month cycle. Mm-hmm. I've even seen organizations and I've had conversations over the phone where people have been like, we don't consider a lapsed donor until they've lapsed over 24 months. It's like, okay, that's fine. Sure. We've had this conversation a few times already, Tim, where it's yeah. like, just do it in a standardized way and measure variance because that's mm-hmm. the most important thing. I see benefit and value in measuring retention rate over a 12-month cycle, year over year. And especially if you're running on a fiscal calendar, your donors don't know about your fiscal calendar. If you want to run your analysis on a fiscal calendar, use 18 months. You're getting, you know, generally speaking, mm-hmm. you're getting a full calendar year in that period cool you'll get you'll be able to have the end of year contributions and things like that contributing to your 18 month over 18 month retention rates this episode is brought to you by us here at market smart and the fundraising report card what is the fundraising report card well it's a free service offered at fundraisingreportcard.com that enhances your fundraising efforts with easy to use analytics and charts Get your proposals approved faster by using these beautiful and elegant charts created automatically with fundraisingreportcard.com. You'll also find a great blog that dives deep into what data means for your organization and how you can use it effectively to make smarter decisions. Start learning and start generating beautiful charts by going to fundraisingreportcard.com. Now back to Metrics That Matter. For building relationships with donors, that seems to be what retention rate is all about. What things should, you know, nonprofits be looking into as they dig into their numbers and to try to improve this this number? So I think I wrote a blog post about this a while back, but one of the ways that you should also segment retention rate that will kind of inform this conversation is yes, giving level is great, but also by type of donor. And what I mean by that is you have your overall donor retention rate, let's say it's Mm -hmm. 50%, but then you have to pose the question, how well are we retaining our newly acquired donors? How well are we retaining our existing base, our our retained donors? How well are we retaining the donors that have reactivated their giving with us last year? And when you start to break down retention rate by those three performance metrics, you can start to influence you know, where should we be allocating more resources towards building those relationships? Whether that be, here's a great example, literally every single data set I've ever looked at, first time donor retention rate. So how well we retain newly acquired donors from last year, this Mm -hmm. year is always lower than repeat donor retention rate. How well we've retained already retained donors from last year, this year, like Literally, I've never seen a data set where first-time donor retention rate is higher than already retained donor retention rate. And, you know, you're looking at me, and you're like, duh, of course, like that yeah. makes sense. But what that starts to tell you is that if we get our first-time donors to make a second contribution in that second year, they're much more likely to be retained in that third year. And maybe what that means is we allocate resources towards a donor welcome series, a 12-month, I know that might sound crazy, but a 12-month donor welcome series Mm -hmm. where the objective is get a second contribution in year two and then we know that they're for example three times more likely to be retained the following year so when you start to break down retention rate in some of these more granular ways you really start to get opportunities to think through where can we change our strategy where can we implement some pretty common tactics Mm -hmm. and see if it's going to have a positive impact one of the challenges here is that what we're talking about implementing doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't even happen over the course of a month. You know, we need another 12 months. We need another 18 months of data to kind of validate our course. But if you think about it, you know, yes, that's a long period of time, but the prior option was to not validate it at all and kind of go with a gut feel and look at the bottom line at the end of the year. You're positioning within your organization the importance of getting a baseline for first-time donor retention rate, for under $100 donor retention rate, for all these kind of key metrics, and then putting together that plan 
having the discussion about why they're low, why they're high, why they're trending in this direction, in that direction. And then 12 months from now, let's rerun the numbers. Let's see what happened. Let's see if what we thought, our hypotheses, if they were actually true. It's the root of evidence-based fundraising. Yeah. Should have a, a, an impact on the bottom line. Something I realize we haven't talked about yet is what is low? <laughs> is there a good target to shoot for with this metric? So I preach to every single organization, every client, every fundraiser I talk to, benchmark against yourself before you benchmark against the industry. So low is going to be relative to your organization. And and if you don't like my answer, we're going to get into the benchmarks in a second here. So we'll we'll talk about that data. But look at the past five years for your own organization. What's your low watermark? I've looked at data sets where first-time donor retention rate is 3%. 3%. You acquire 100 new donors the prior year, three of them came back the next year. That's low. Yeah. I mean, that's low no matter what. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so benchmark against yourself and see what that number is. Now, when you think about kind of across the industry, across Mm -hmm. the sector, yeah, there's some low watermarks. I think first-time donor retention rate for healthcare institutions in particular is like 9%. Yeah. Okay. So that's like hospital foundations. That's hospitals. That's healthcare foundation. I mean, that is low. It's very low. If you're at a hospital right now or a hospital foundation, you're a a gifts officer or director of development or chief development officer, you could benchmark against that. You could say, okay, we're at 13%, which also feels really low, but it's actually higher. These metrics and on the benchmark page, we break them down by giving level and, and those other segments as well. And I think the average retention rate across all of our data is somewhere around 40%. Like forty one percent, we're a little mm-hmm. bit below where the the FEP, the fundraising effectiveness project, they put out a report annually. We're a little bit lower than what they have, and I think Blackbot Giving Institute also has a report. I think they're at like forty two percent. We're right around forty point oh five percent or forty point five percent for retention rate. Low is also then going to be broken down by sector. So if you were to look at healthcare again, sorry to pick on healthcare, but mm-hmm. their retention rates are really really low. If you were to compare that to like an arts and humanities organization their low is going to be a different barometer. It's you know probably two or three times higher when it comes to retention rate. But again, look at your own organization against yourself, then start to look at some of these peer metrics to see, okay, how well are we doing relative to the industry at large? Okay. Is age something you should segment for to perhaps let's try to retain a lot of younger, low dollar donors and uh, as they get older, maybe they become high dollar donors. I don't know if that's a strategy people would do. It could be. I mean, in my practice, I haven't had an opportunity to really do too much age segmentation when it comes to Mm -hmm. analyzing retention. It's more like, you know, let's compare all the events donors versus literally everything else. Let's see if we retain our events donors as well as we do our other donors. But sure, you could break this down by age. And especially if your organization has had a commitment towards millennial giving, let's bring in more millennials. That's great. Yeah, but have a plan to retain them. So sure, break down retention rates by age range and by age bracket. If you're at a small shop and you're listening to this right now, let's not you know do some like super demographic segmented retention rates. Like there's mm-hmm. no need to do twenty to to twenty eight year old Caucasian male retention rates. Like, sure, don't yeah. do that. Let's start with some of the ones that we've discussed. Get that overall. Mm-hmm. Don't get fixated on overall. Look at giving level segmentation. Make sure that you are retaining your high dollar donors at a higher retention rate than some of the other segments. Identify opportunities there and then look at first time versus repeat donor retention rate. You could throw in reactivated as well, but honestly, that'll be a shiny object. For most organizations, you don't need to necessarily worry about that right now, although it is really cool and compelling to think about why did a donor lapse, then reactivate, then lapse again. Why didn't they renew? But Mm -hmm. nonetheless, first time donor retention rate, repeat donor retention rate, overall donor retention rate, In dollar amount segmentation, you could do age, you could do some of these other things we're talking about, but focusing on your 80-20 would kind of be those particular areas. Okay. And anything else we didn't cover that you want to touch on? I think a big thing, and I know I mentioned it briefly earlier, is retained donors tend to give more than uh, newly acquired donors. So when thinking about a long-term plan for sustainability at the organization, retention has to be a piece. You can't just churn. Mm -hmm. You really, really can't. We would be out of business if we just churned. Any sustainable organization has that strong base of support. And obviously we want to grow that strong base of support, but never lose sight of those that are kind of with us. And retention rate is that quantifiable way to make sure that we're not losing sight of those people. So they're going to bring in more money. They're going to be a long-term strategy, but they're the donors that give you a sustainable organization and that can never be overlooked. It's incredibly important. We talked about acquisition costs, I think it was last episode. Is there a retention 
costs that you should be factoring and trying to figure out for major donors how much should we spend on each one to retain them? Is that something they should do? Yeah. So a lot of my research, I haven't dug too deep into how do you actually calculate and then keep track of lifetime expense of a relationship. Yeah. That'd be, I mean, I'm even thinking for our business, (laughs) like, wow, (laughs) that would be incredibly challenging. Mm -hmm. But the sentiment that you bring up is accurate. It's true. It's like, you know, yes, acquiring a donor. So donor acquisition costs, what we talked about is, you know, one metric to measure, but there's genuine expense in stewarding and building and cultivating Mm -hmm. a relationship with a mid-level donor, an annual fund donor, and of course your your major gift prospects as well. So to quantify that, yeah, in an ideal world, we'd have a way to do it. Unfortunately, and I'm the data guy, you know, I I haven't been exposed to any organizations that are really revolutionary in how they're approaching that, which is unfortunate because Mm -hmm. it it takes the kind of quantifiable and the data out of the decision-making process. Yeah. But I think with some of these underlying metrics, you can start to build the case for support for why we're approaching things in a certain way. So you bring up a good point, Tim. Maybe you've got some weekend time this week. Uh, yeah, this week. yeah you knock can, it uh, out, yeah. <laughs> well, I was just thinking, uh, it may boil down to just being in someone's portfolio, uh, their donor portfolio, if it's a major gift officer, and looking at their giving history and seeing what percentage may make sense as a amount to invest in that person perhaps as a yeah spend. but it's hard it's hard then it's like okay we pay this gift officer x amount and then it's back <laughs> to like the donor acquisition uh, calculation costs conversation which is like well then do we include other expenses like the rent for the building and, the, and like yeah you need teams and you need a very because again it comes back to standardization mm-hmm. so yeah you could do what we're describing here but you would have to have your whole team on the same page from day one here are the requirements here are our expectations for how you calculate donor life cycle costs yeah no oh, it gets, man it gets messy i'm yeah. gonna need a lot more <laughs> coffee to even think that one through yeah <laughs> <laughs> maybe some sea salt chocolate too yeah, that could actually be good. yeah been, yeah yeah we should do like a giveaway at some point some just random podcast giveaway and you get like a market smart light bulb and a t-shirt and some sea salt like chocolate yeah 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 edit that out so that we don't actually have to no don't edit <laughs> <laughs> hey at some point in the uh never-ending future yeah, we'll do it like when we get uh, enough subscribers or something like that yes yeah like we idea. can totally bribe subscribers with, i like this with yeah. chocolate yeah. This kind of reminds me of my college days. That's how I used to feed myself. Was. You also bribed them for reviews. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good stuff. Do it again next week. Sounds good. See you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of Metrics That Matter. If you like the show, make sure to review it on Apple Podcasts and pass along to a colleague. Download the Metrics That Matter ebook at www.fundraisingreportcard.com slash book. Thanks again for listening.